You are meant to live in overflow. I promise you that no matter who you are or how you got to this teaching, I want you to know you were meant to live in overflow. That is how it is supposed to be in your life. And I believe this is meant to be the year that you step into overflow like never before. And that is what this teaching is all about. And that is what I am going to do everything in my power to support you in over the next moments that we spend together. This is the Stefan Lovegrove Show. All things are possible for the one who believes, and you are the one. We're going to dive in immediately today. If you are with me on YouTube and you are ready to go, ready to receive this teaching and hear something specific and personal for your life today, Hit that like button. Let me know that you are here. And thank you for being here and doing your part to support this channel and support this work. This teaching is entitled From Over Leveraged to Overflowing. And if you've been in my community for any length of time, you may know. I actually did a paid program. I actually released and offered a course last year by this same title, From Over Leveraged to Overflowing. And so as we get started, I just want to acknowledge, I found myself in a little bit of a new, unfamiliar, strange moment, if you will, because as I was praying and asking God, what am I meant to share with my community in these teachings this year? I kept feeling guided back to this, and I couldn't shake the thought. It wouldn't leave. I just felt so clear there was something for us here, and I needed to return to this. Now, it was a strange feeling because that's not something I've ever done before, and that's not something I would typically do in terms of taking something that was a course and then re-teaching it and putting it out there for the whole world on YouTube and on the podcast. It's not like I can't do that, but it's not something that I'm in the habit of doing. And so I found myself asking God, if you're going to keep bringing my attention back to this, I'm willing to explore it again. <laughs> I'm willing to study it again. I'm willing to teach it again in a new capacity, but I found myself asking God, show me why is this teaching so necessary for our community and for the world? If I'm feeling this clearly guided to it, I asked God, show me why is this so important and needed and relevant right now? And why are you calling me to return to it at this moment in time. And here's what I heard. I wrote it all down and wanted to share it with you verbatim as I heard it. God told me, number one, because my children were not created to bear the burden of being endlessly overleveraged. God said, my children were not created to bear the burden of being endlessly overleveraged. And there are so many people out there listening to this teaching, and that is where you have been living, and that is what you have been experiencing, and you feel absolutely trapped and stuck there. But that's not how life was intended to be. That's not where you were meant to live. And I believe God is saying as we get started today, that burden will be lifted. Number two, God told me, this teaching is so needed right now because overflow is my will for every single person. It is what they were created for. It is what they were intended for. It is how life was meant to be for them. 
but that is not a truth that has been taught. That is not a truth that many people have ever heard or are even aware of, much less believe at the core of their being. And so number two, God told me this teaching is so necessary because overflow is my will for every single person and people don't know that and people haven't been taught that. Number three, God told me, this teaching is necessary because it moves people out of their limited thinking and into the spiritual realm of infinite possibility, which is 100% true. And I want to be very clear. This is not just a teaching about money, though it certainly applies to that. And this is not even just a teaching about overflow, though we will be spending a lot of time on that topic today. But this is a teaching about divine provision. This is a teaching about miracles. This is a teaching about getting out of the past, out of a crisis, out of all forms of limitation, and into the realm of the infinite where truly all things are possible. And so again, it's not just about money. It's not even just about overflow. But this teaching has such far reaching implications in your life. Then number four, God told me, this teaching is important right at this moment because people need to understand just how quickly their lives can change. And I'm just going to share it with you the way I heard it. God said, well, it may not always be overnight. I want people to know Their lives can change so much faster than they think. And it's time to get their faith behind the change again. People need to understand just how quickly life can really change. Then number five, I heard. This teaching is important. Because divine provision is necessary, required, and essential for every person living with purpose to complete their assignment. Let me read that one again because there's a lot in that sentence. Divine provision is necessary, required, and essential for every person living with purpose to complete their assignment. I want to know in the comments here on YouTube, are you a person who knows that you have a divine assignment, that there is a purpose for your life, that there is someone you are called to be and something you are called to do while you are here in this human experience? Let me know. If you are somebody who is clear that you are living with purpose and intention and assignment, but if that's you, I believe this message is so clear. Divine provision is necessary for you. Divine provision is required for you. Divine provision is essential if you are going to live with purpose and complete your assignment. And so this teaching today is important for all of those reasons. And then even beyond those five, on a very personal note, I felt like God said to me, this teaching is so important because prosperity is part of your assignment as a spiritual teacher. This one I'm really just sharing with you for transparency's sake, but I really did feel like God said to me, on a personal note, I want you to know prosperity is part of your assignment as a spiritual teacher. And if we can have a real moment together, family, and they're all real moments, but this one is extra real, extra juicy, extra vulnerable, I just want to say here, I fought that for a long time. I resisted that for a long time because I really did not want for this to be my assignment. I didn't want to be the prosperity person. I didn't want to have to teach on this stuff that not everybody would agree with, and it might be controversial, and it might get pushed back. 
but it's just how I'm wired that when something blesses my life, I can't help but want to share it. That when something has changed my life, naturally I find myself wanting to give it to the world in overflow. And so God made it clear to me, this is also important. Because prosperity is part of your assignment as a spiritual teacher. And I am owning that. And let me just say, I have spent so much time editing and studying and revising this thing. The other day I recorded an hour's worth of content and then I felt like I needed to restart because I wasn't getting the frequency that this teaching was meant to be delivered in. And it's always tough because I I don't want to give in to resistance. I don't want to live in perfectionism. But it is so important to me to get this right and to deliver it in as effective of a manner as possible because I am committed to you, to your prosperity, and to your overflow. And again, I believe this teaching is important for all of the reasons I just listed and quite simply that it's part of my assignment to share this message of prosperity and abundance and overflow with you. So here we are, everybody, from over-leveraged to overflowing. And I'm going to invite you in this moment, text somebody right now as you listen and send them this link. Whether you're on YouTube or whether you're on the podcast, I want to invite you text somebody right now and send them this link. Or if you are a leader, if you've got a big reach, if you've got a community online and you feel led to do so, you can even share it there and share it with them. But I really feel called to invite you, send somebody this link, whoever it is that you know, whoever God brings to mind that could use more abundance in their life. And I want to invite you to listen to this with them. I don't mean you have to meet up in a coffee shop. I don't mean you have to wait until you're both in the same room. But go through this with somebody else. Somebody that you care about, somebody that you love, somebody that you know could use more abundance in their life because there is a message for you here. There is a message for them. And I am utterly committed to get this message of overflow out to the whole world. So I want to begin by reading the text of an ancient story that I was guided to last year. When I first taught a message around this idea of from over leverage to overflowing, I'm going to be reading here from the Gospel of John chapter 6, along with other texts mixed in, just to give us all the details of the story. But before I start reading, I do want to mention here, for important context, this is the only story that every single record of Jesus gives us. The only one. For context, they don't all record even the Christmas story. They don't all record the story of the resurrection. You would be shocked at how many familiar, common, well-known stories there are that only appear one place or just a handful of places. But this one, This story is the one and only story that appears in every gospel account. For whatever reason, every single author thought we needed this story when it came to the life of Jesus. And I believe that just goes to show us how important the truth, the principles, the miracle of overflow really is. So let's dive in now, reading again primarily from John chapter 6 here. It says, And a massive crowd of people followed him everywhere. They were attracted by his miracles and the healings they watched him perform. And Jesus went up the slope of a hill and sat down with his disciples. As Jesus sat down, he looked out and saw the massive crowd of people scrambling up the hill for they wanted to be near him. 
And late that afternoon, his disciples said, it's getting really late. And we're here in this remote place with nothing to eat. You should send the crowds away so that they can go into the surrounding villages and buy food. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. Are you sure, they replied, you really want us to go buy them supper? It would cost a small fortune to feed all these thousands of hungry people. Now, Jesus already knew what he was about to do, but he said this to stretch their faith. And just then, Andrew, Peter's brother, spoke up and said, look, here is a young person with five barley loaves and two small fish. But how far would that go with this huge crowd? Have everyone sit down, Jesus said to his disciples. And so on the vast grassy slope, more than 5,000 hungry people sat down. Then Jesus took the five loaves and two fish gazed into heaven and gave thanks to God. He broke the bread and the two fish and distributed them to his disciples to serve the people. And the food was multiplied in front of their eyes. Everyone had plenty to eat and was fully satisfied. Then the 12 disciples picked up what remained and each of them ended up with a basket full of leftovers. I want to take a second here to pause and to pray over this teaching. If it is safe and comfortable to do so where you are, go ahead and close your eyes with me now as we go into a brief moment of prayer together. God, I ask for your support your presence, your strength, your guidance, and your word speaking through me as I deliver this teaching now. I have done my best to get ready for it. I have prayed over it. I have studied and prepared and revised, revised, revised my notes. And God, I am here and ready to go, excited about the message that is on my heart to bring to my community today. But I just ask that you would speak through me now as you have never done before. I speak the truth. That it is not just I who do these things, but it is God who moves through me. And that is my truth as I stand here with this microphone and record right now. God, I pray that you would direct me, lead me, and guide me as I teach today. That I would share everything I am meant to say during this time. And nothing that would not be beneficial to this particular teaching in every single person hearing it today. You know my heart and you know my intention with every one of these teachings, God, for the person who is under the sound of my voice right now. I pray that this would be helpful and practical and useful for their mind. I pray that this would be moving and impactful and healing for their heart. And most of all, God, I pray that this would be permanently life-changing in all areas of their life. I trust you, God. I trust you to speak through me now. I know that every single person listening has a different background, has a different belief system, has different circumstances and situations and things weighing heavy on their mind and their heart as they enter this teaching. But I know, God, that all of your presence is right with them, every single person right where they are. So I pray that you would speak to them in a powerful and a personal way. I pray that every single person listening today would get exactly what they need and came for and even more in our time together. God, as I was preparing for this training, I felt led to pray over it. Do what only you can do. I'm going to do my best to share the message you've given me here, God. But I ask you, 
as I surrender in this moment to the flow, do what only you can do. And in the spirit of the story we just read, God, I ask, would you use the contribution of one to bless and to impact and to increase many, many, many lives? That is my prayer. And that is what I know is happening as this word goes forth. May this contribution be used to bless many beyond anything we could ever ask, think, or imagine. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God. And so it is, and so we are. Amen and amen. And let me know on YouTube if you just prayed with me and you are ready to go. Ready to receive from over-leveraged to overflowing. Now, I really want you to imagine with me for a few moments the dramatic situation that this story presents. I don't want it to just be a story. I don't want us to feel disconnected from the reality it is describing. I don't want it to feel far away or ethereal or hard to imagine. But I want us really to envision in a practical, tangible, literal way, the situation that this story presents. Particularly, I want to invite you, see if you can find yourself in it. Whether it is something you have experienced before in the past or something you are going through right now, see if you can find yourself in this story. You know, we're talking about a large crowd of people here. Many have called this story the feeding of the 5,000. But if you grew up in Sunday school, what you probably also heard is that it was just 5,000 men plus women and children and partners and family and everybody who would have been with them. And so when all is said and done, historians estimate this story is describing a crowd of fifteen to 20,000 people. Now, at the time of this recording, the Grammy Awards just took place at the Crypto.com Arena in downtown LA, formerly and maybe more famously known as the Staples Center. And I bring that up because that is the size of capacity of a venue like that iconic arena. So if you need a visual, think about the size of a crowd that would fill up an entire arena. Anywhere from 15 to 20,000 plus people. That is what we are talking about here. Being present in the crowd of this story. And of course, as we read, the story tells us these people have been sitting there patiently listening to Jesus teach and observing all of these things that are unfolding. But they've been sitting there all day in this position with no food or access to food throughout. And again, I want us to really imagine this. I want us to really go there as we read this story today. Because if you've ever been to a music festival or some type of conference or some type of an event, you probably have experienced a moment where the hunger was catching up to you. Maybe the claustrophobia was catching up to you. Maybe the need to find a restroom was catching up to you, right? All kinds of things can happen in a situation with a large crowd. And there's a lot of concerns and a lot of possible issues and problems and emergencies that can arise. And as we think about this story, I really want you to think about This giant crowd of people, 15 to 20,000 people, and they've been out in the sun all day. No access to food or water, stuck in the middle of a giant crowd, and we are quickly approaching this becoming a very bad situation. Now, somebody on Jesus' team is paying attention (laughs) to the details and the logistics and exactly what is unfolding in the crowd. 
And as these different accounts record for us, somebody comes up to Jesus and suggests, we really need to dismiss these people as soon as possible so they can figure this out. Now, notice this, and I think this is quite a funny detail of the story. When the person on Jesus' team comes up to him and says, hey, 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 we need to dismiss as soon as possible, notice, not only were they not looking for a miracle, they weren't even looking to originally solve the problem. Like, if you pay attention to how the story unfolds, They weren't taking responsibility for this. They had no intention of feeding the crowd. They weren't at all trying to solve the problem. They just wanted it to be off their hands. They just wanted the crowd to be on their own. And yet Jesus says, why don't you feed them? Why don't we feed them? which sends the clear message, and I want you to hear this today. There is, in fact, something that can be done. There is, in fact, a solution available. And I feel so strongly that that message is going out to somebody today. You have felt stuck. You have felt trapped. You have felt isolated. You have felt abandoned. You have felt like all hope is lost, like there's nothing that can be done, like you've exhausted all options. And I believe this message comes to somebody today. There is, in fact, something that can be done. There is, in fact, a solution available. You are not stuck. It is not too late. And it is not too big of a problem that it cannot be solved. That's a powerful shift in and of itself in this story. Because the disciples are originally just trying to offload the problem. We don't want to think about this. We don't want to deal with this. We don't want to have to be responsible for this. The story begins with absolutely no one looking for a miracle. And in fact, on the contrary, just some people starting to get nervous, wanting to get a problem off their hands. But Jesus sees possibility. Jesus sees opportunity. Jesus sees potential. And he sends the message, there is, in fact, something that can be done. There is, in fact, a solution available. Now, I want to go one layer deeper here just to get very specific and clear and vivid about the exact problem that they were facing. The problem that the team was wanting to offload. The problem that looked like there was no way to fix. And I want to sit with this for a moment because before we point fingers at them for not seeing the opportunity of a miracle, I want to point out, it really did look like it was about to be a very bad situation. It really did not look good. It really did not look solvable on the surface. You know, one version of the story tells us that the disciples said to themselves, even if we just gave every person a small snack, it would take nearly eight months of work to pay for that. Feel into that for a moment. Even if we just gave every person a small snack, it would take nearly eight months of work to pay for it. You know, I added that up when I was studying this text. I wanted to know exactly what we were talking about here in the most vivid terms. And can I tell you, we are talking about over a thousand hours of work would have been required. So do you see what I mean about it looking impossible, it it looking overwhelming, it looking like a situation that did not have a good solution? The disciples are looking at these people and thinking, even if we just wanted to give them all a little snack, not a dinner, 
Not a full meal, not a great meal. Even if we just wanted to give them all a little snack, it would take eight months of work. It would take a thousand work hours to be able to pay for that. And quite literally, they did not have eight months of time before the people needed fed. Quite literally, they did not have a thousand hours before people needed to eat. So as Jesus says, why don't we feed them? That feels impossible. That seems impossible. That looks impossible. And I wanted to really take my time to go into all of that here because I would argue this is a story and this is a situation where they were by definition over leverage. Now, you all know me. You know I love a good definition. And if I'm going to say that they were by definition over leveraged, we might need a definition here. So let's do some definitions for a moment about both of our core concepts today, over leveraged and overflowing. Okay. We'll start with over leveraged. So my definition of over leveraged is having taken on too much to the point of strain, pain, or discomfort in the hopes of future advantage. Having taken on too much to the point of strain, pain, or discomfort in the hopes of future advantage. Put more simply, over leveraged is when you have used all of the leverage available to you to a maximum degree and now you feel spent and now you are exhausted and now it feels like you have nothing left to try or to give or to offer. That is over leveraged and people can feel over leveraged with their time. People can feel over leveraged with their money. People can feel over leveraged with their energy, with their relationships, with their gifts or their skills or their talent or their health or, or their anything over leveraged when it feels like you have used all of the leverage available to you to a maximum degree and now you feel spent and now you are exhausted now you have nothing left to try or to give or to offer I have been there. I know that feeling. And if you're there today in any area of your life, I want you to know, I may not know your name. I may not know your story. I may not know exactly where you feel over leveraged in your life, but you know, and more importantly, God knows, and you are not alone and you are loved and you are supported even in, and especially in the place that you feel over leveraged. But that's what we're talking about here with over leveraged. And I want to make this clarification before we move forward. Leverage is not a bad thing. It's not bad to have leverage. It's not bad to use leverage. I want to make that very clear as we move forward here. Leverage is not inherently bad, but... Over leveraged never feels good. And sometimes the worst part of all is that that feeling creeps up on us and we don't even realize we are over leveraged until it's too late. And then it just feels overwhelming. Then it just feels impossible sometimes to overcome. Again, I have been there. I know that feeling. I know what that is like. And I got to tell you, as I started studying this last year, this story fascinated me because after a decade of running a business in the online space, one thing that started to become very clear to me is that people are so used to being over leveraged. People are so used to being over leveraged. And I actually think that's true in many different realms of life, not just the online space. 
But this started to become so clear to me. And particularly, I suddenly realized last year in a moment of clarity that I will never forget. Not only are so many people over leveraged, they actually think that is how it has to be. They actually think that is correct, that that is how it's supposed to be. I started to realize so many people have been taught that this is spiritual. This is required. This is just what life is perpetually like as an entrepreneur. And I started to realize suddenly so many entrepreneurs and leaders and people of faith are being taught over leverage is just simply what it takes. And over leverage is just how it's always going to feel. And yet, I don't think that's the truth. And I don't think that's what this story shows us. I think this story actually tells us the opposite. See, the more I studied this, the more I started to see this story shows us two clear realities simultaneously. And somebody please type this out in the comments with the timestamp. Somebody please write this down if you're taking notes. God is not threatened by you being over leveraged in the moment. And God writes stories that end in overflow. God is not threatened by you being over leveraged in the moment. And God writes stories that end in overflow. Now, we're going to unpack all of this over the next few moments. But do you see the reality of those parallel truths? Yes, God is not threatened by you being over leveraged. It is okay if you're there and we're going to talk about that and release any judgment you might have on that in a moment. But also... That doesn't mean that over leveraged is how it was meant to be or where you have to stay. And God writes stories that end in overflow. In other words, here's another way that we could say it. Over leveraged is a temporary experience that yes, sometimes we find ourselves in. And Overflow is meant to be where your story ends. And also, I would add on to that, where you consistently live. Let me read that again. Overleveraged is a temporary experience that we sometimes find ourselves in. And overflow is meant to be where your story ends and where you consistently live. I pray today, family, that you stop settling for over leveraged, even if that's how it's always been, even if that's what you were raised with in your childhood, even if that's always what has been modeled to you or taught to you or demonstrated to you as just the way it is. I pray today, that you stop settling for overleveraged. I pray today that you stop expecting overleveraged in your life. And I pray today that you recognize overleveraged is not serving you and more importantly, not required. Because overflow is available. That's the good news of this teaching today. Overflow is available to you. Yes, you. It's available to you. So now let's go to that definition. We did a definition of over leverage. Now I want to go to the definition of overflow. So the dictionary definition of overflow is excess, surplus, more than enough, above and beyond, more than can even be contained. That is the dictionary definition of overflow. Excess, surplus, more than enough, above and beyond, more than can even be contained. And if we can go into a coaching moment together for a second, I just want you to ask yourself for a moment, what is your initial reaction to hearing that definition? In fact, I would invite you, pause this teaching to really sit with yourself for a moment and feel into it. As you hear that concept, 
excess, surplus, more than enough, above and beyond, more than can even be contained. If you need to, take a second, pause this teaching, and really just observe. What do you think initially as you sit with the concept of overflow? Observe your thoughts. What thoughts are running through your mind? How does it feel to you initially and instinctively to sit with the idea of overflow? What feelings do you observe? What feelings do you notice in your body? And what do you believe, consciously or subconsciously, about anyone who is currently having that experience? Let's make it so vivid. Let's make it so practical. What do you believe about people who have excess, people who have surplus, people who have way more than enough, people who live lives that are above and beyond, people who seem to have more than can even be contained? What do you believe about that? What do you believe about those people? I want to invite you to observe, observe, observe. Because what this story demonstrates to us is God creates overflow. And you, yes, you, whoever you are listening to this, you are able to live in overflow, even if you have found yourself over leveraged. Now, that is the truth. God creates overflow, and you are able to live in overflow even if you have found yourself overleveraged. And by the way, this teaching really is for everyone, no matter where you are on your journey from overleveraged to overflow. Maybe you still find yourself today in the depths of overleveraged, and that's okay. And I love you if that's where you're at and that's what you're living right now and this teaching is for you and it is reaching you right on time. Maybe you're listening to this and you're somewhere in the middle. You're somewhere in that bridge walking from over leverage to overflowing. You're somewhere in transition. Or maybe you've had a taste of overflow. And now you want to expand in that. Now you want to grow and increase in that more and more and more. Wherever you are on your journey, from over leverage to overflowing, this teaching is for you. And the truth, again, is that God creates overflow. And no matter who you are, you are able to and meant to live in overflow. Now, I already read the technical definition to you a moment ago. But I want to take it a step further here and really lean in here because I believe this next section is going to change somebody's life, somebody's worldview, somebody's belief system today. I want us to look at God's definition of overflow as demonstrated in this story so that you can make it your own personal definition and standard of overflow. So please, 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 if you are taking notes, write this down and somebody type this out in the comments with a timestamp for everybody here on YouTube. But again, as we look at this story, I want us to look at God's standard of overflow as demonstrated here, okay? So the text tells us, let me scroll up and read it again. We begin with five loaves and two fish. That is our starting point. But recognize your starting point is not an indicator of where the story ends. And I pray somebody is receiving that today. Your starting point doesn't have to mean anything else other than just simply it is your starting point right now. Your starting point is not a prophecy. Your starting point is not your destiny. Your starting point is not an indicator of where the story is going to end. Can I get an amen on that truth today? I feel this message. Okay, so we begin with the starting point of five loaves and two fish. But now let's look at where the story ends and God's definition of overflow. 
the five loaves and two fish turn into enough to serve the people where the food is multiplied right in front of their eyes. And again, this is what the text tells us. Everyone had plenty to eat and was fully satisfied. One version of this tells us they all got to eat until they were full. Then the 12 disciples picked up what remained and each of them, every single person on Jesus' team, ended up with a full basket of leftovers. So here it is. And again, type this out in the comments. Write this down if you're taking notes. God's standard of overflow from this story. Let's go through it now. Number one, all needs met. And notice, this is the baseline, not the finish line. Yes, all needs met is a part of the story of divine provision, but it is assumed. It is built in. It is just the foundation. All needs met is the baseline, not the finish line. And I really feel called to emphasize this today because if you grew up in church like me, perhaps the only thing that you ever heard taught is that God can meet your needs. And if we're really being honest, They didn't say it in a way that it was just assumed, that it was a sure foundation, that it was something we could absolutely count on. If we're really telling the full truth about it, the way most of us were raised, the way many of us grew up, is we were taught this idea that God can meet your needs, but we're not really sure if God's going to, and we better pray and pray and pray harder for our needs to be met. And so... If you're like me and that's how you were raised when it came to this area, you might have never been told that the blessing of God makes rich with no sorrow added to it, which, by the way, is a Bible verse. There might have been a lot of truths and a lot of principles that you were never taught. And again, I think part of my assignment is sharing this vital truth about prosperity with you, with my community, and with the world. But I want us to see all needs met was always supposed to be the baseline, not the finish line. So number one, God's standard of overflow is yes, your needs are met. That is the beginning. Number two, God's standard of overflow is that there is enough for you to be full and satisfied and enjoy it. There is enough for you to be full and satisfied and enjoy it. God cares about your wholeness. God cares about your satisfaction. God cares about your joy. And I can feel that this is a mind and heart surgery for us today. I can feel this is healing and up-leveling someone today to know that God cares about your wholeness. God cares about your satisfaction. God cares about your joy. So number two, God's standard of overflow is enough for you to be full and satisfied and able to enjoy. Number three, God's standard of overflow includes enough to bless the people around me. Enough to bless the people around me. What does that mean? God's standard of overflow is that there must be enough, enough left over, enough surplus, enough extra for you to be able to be generous, for you to be able to give. And you are not meant to prosper in isolation. And I am so committed as a leader in this community that I don't want to prosper in isolation. I don't want any of us, clients, partners, friends, I don't want anybody in my world prospering in isolation. But God's standard of overflow includes, number three, enough to be generous, enough to give, enough to bless the people around me. And then number four, God's standard of overflow last but certainly not least includes still more left over. And I cannot overemphasize this last point enough because if number four is not in the list, it is not truly overflow. 
I pray that that clicks for someone today. If number four is not in the list, we're not talking overflow. If all of your needs are met, but that maxes out the budget, we're not talking overflow. If you are full and satisfied, but also broke at the end of the day and everything is spent, we're not talking overflow. If you are able to give, but then you never have anything left at the end, we're not talking about overflow. Hear this today and let it up-level your consciousness. We're not talking about overflow until after everything else, after the money is circulated, after the money is spent and utilized and enjoyed, after all the needs are met, after everybody is full, after people are blessed and generosity has been enacted. Overflow is when after all of that, There is still more left over. And I wanted to take my time with this today because this is God's standard of overflow that I pray is becoming your new standard, your new paradigm, your new expectation, your new belief system, your new definition of overflow today. Let me know in the comments if you joyfully accept and step into with me today a new definition of overflow. And God, thank you for guiding me to re-record this teaching and to take my time with it and to be patient until I could get it right because I feel this flowing so powerfully today and I feel like this is exactly how it needed to be taught. And as we discuss God's standard of overflow, God's definition of overflow, I really want to encourage you to try this on for yourself, even if it's new or uncomfortable or feels completely impossible. Even if that's the case, that's okay. You're not alone. We're all doing this together as a community. But I want you to try this on and I invite you to ask, What would this be like? What would it feel like? What would it look like in your own reality? I want you to make it real, make it vivid, make it personal today. God's standard of overflow. What would that look like in your life? In fact, if you want to close your eyes and go there with me right now, we can do this together. Perhaps you want to close your eyes, settle into this moment, Perhaps you might feel drawn to put a hand over your heart, to get comfortable, to take a big, deep breath or two. And again, I just invite you to try on what this feels like. God's standard, God's definition, God's level of overflow. First of all, I want you to feel into how does it feel to know that all of your needs are met, that you never have to worry, that you never have to be afraid, that you never have to stress, but that you can count on this, that this is a sure thing. Every need is always met. How does that feel? Try it on right now. Then I want you to try on. What if there was always plenty of money in the equation for you to say yes to your desires, for you to say yes in the moment to anything you felt called to do, for you to feel safe and comfortable and to be able to trust yourself enough to enjoy. What would that be like? What would that feel like? Try it on right now. I want you to Try on with me in consciousness right now. What if you always were able to give anywhere, anytime, any place that you felt called? What if you always had funds available to give? And what if there was no limitation to how much you could give? What if you could give in a substantial way to that which you believe in the most? Feel into it. Try it on right now. And then most of all, I just want you to try on. What if after and beneath 
all other transactions, all investments, all purchases, all spending, all circulation. What if after all was said and done in your financial life this month, there was still a large amount left over in every single account. And there was not a single need that hadn't been met. There was not a single desire that hadn't been fulfilled. There was not any place the money needed to go or was supposed to go. It was just left over. It was just above and beyond. It was just surplus. It was just extra that was there just because. How would that feel? Try that on in consciousness. And if you want to pause this and just feel into it some more today, go right ahead. But I really want this to become real and vivid and personal for you because we are introducing a new normal for your life with this teaching. And please hear me. You don't have to get there today. And you don't even have to know how to get there right now. That's okay, but I want you to hear loud and clear today that this is possible for you. And if this is new, if this is unfamiliar, if this is hard to believe, too good to be true, sounding, you don't know what's the thing, that's okay. But faith comes by hearing, and we first have to hear and encounter a new idea before we can try it on and step into it and experience it for ourselves. So I pray that this new idea is reaching you at the deepest level of consciousness. I pray that you're trying it on. I pray that you're considering that this may be a new normal that you get to have in your life. But those are our definitions. That is over leveraged and that is overflow. And of course, the natural question becomes, how do we get from one to the other? We've talked about over leveraged. We've talked about overflowing. How do we get from one to the other? And I want to make it very clear. My prayer is for every person listening today to walk across that bridge. Again, as I said earlier in the teaching, I don't believe it's going to be an overnight thing. But I do believe this is a shift that every single person in this community can make. And I'll even take it a step further and boldly say, I believe with all my heart, this is a shift that you can make this year. It makes me think of a quote from one of my mentors who says, people often overestimate how much their lives can change in one day and often underestimate how much their lives can change in a year. And I really believe that is true. So many people in personal development think that they're manifesting wrong, think that they are not worthy, think that they must not be doing it right because it didn't all change instantaneously and it didn't all happen overnight. And I want you to consider this thought that perhaps we overestimate how much change is going to happen within a single day, at least in a visible way that we can measure and observe and track right then. But at the same time, we underestimate just how much can shift for us in a year. So my prayer, my intention, that I speak over every single person listening today is that you would walk across this bridge from over leveraged to overflowing. I am praying and believing this is your year to walk across this bridge and it doesn't have to happen overnight, but it absolutely can happen faster than you think and it absolutely can happen for you. Now, if you're listening to this teaching today, Chances are you want to move across this bridge, but you don't know how to, which makes sense, right? Because if you knew how to get across the bridge, you would have already done it by now. But you haven't yet been able to crack the code. You haven't yet been able to figure this one out. And that's okay. Here's the good news that I came to deliver to you today. 
please write this down if you're taking notes and somebody please type this out in the comments. The good news is God has a plan to move you from over leverage to overflowing. God knows how to get you into overflow. Now, I want everybody to write that down if you're taking notes, but specifically, I want to invite you to affirm this for yourself in the comments if you're willing to step into it in faith now, that God has a plan for my overflow, and God knows how to get me to overflowing. God has a plan for my overflow. God knows how to get me to overflowing. God has a plan for my overflow. God knows how to get me to overflowing. Notice I'm not telling you that you have to find the plan. I'm not telling you that you have to know how. I'm not telling you that you have to make this happen, right? And I'm also not showing up from a Dave Ramsey frequency today. I'm also not here to tell you that you better not eat out at a restaurant until you figure this out. <laughs> that is not my heart. That is not the message today. That is not the frequency of this training. But the truth that I came to deliver to you today is that God has a plan for your overflow and God knows how to get you to overflowing. And I pray that you are affirming that with me today. And I see you in the comments. I read those comments as you all step into these things by faith. So I pray that you are affirming this with me now. God has a plan for my overflow and God knows how to get me to overflowing and I feel called to emphasize here. Also notice, God's plan for your overflow is probably going to be personalized to you. So the plan for you does not have to look like the plan for me. And it's probably going to be completely different and unique and one of a kind and personalized and customized. But if this story tells us anything today, this story that was so important, it was in every single gospel, more than the Christmas story and more than the resurrection. If this story tells us anything, it is that God knows how to get you from over leverage to overflowing. And so as we talk about making this transition, crossing this bridge today. I want to give you a few universal principles that I have observed and that we can observe from this story about the path to overflow. If you're taking notes or typing notes out in the comments, these are universal principles about the path to overflowing. Number one, principle number one today God is not judging you for your situation. Principle number one of the path to overflow, God is not judging you for your situation. Now, I shared on social media, I have already taught around this concept for a course, but as I mentioned earlier, I was guided back to this topic for a teaching for this community, and God gave me new material, new concepts, new ideas specifically for this one. And this is one that I really want to highlight. Because as I revisited this to prepare to teach you today, God showed me something so clearly in this story that I had never seen before. It blew my mind, actually, that I had missed this, that I had never seen it before. But sometimes we don't see something until we're ready to. Sometimes the path doesn't illuminate until we have a belief system to actually support us walking on it. And I believe that's happening for so many of you today with overflowing, but hear this principle number one. God is not judging you for whatever situation you are in. And I promise that applies to you. You are not the exception. I am talking to you, whoever you are listening to this. And God is no respecter of persons. This message is just as much for you as it is for anybody else. And I want you to hear today, God is not judging you for your situation. See, when I started to revisit this story, 
for this particular teaching. God showed me the crowd in the story did nothing wrong to end up over leveraged. Think about this with me. Because see, the original time that I taught this story, I emphasized how much of a crisis situation this was, how scary it was getting, how impossible it looked. And it would take eight months and it would take over a thousand hours just to get everybody a little snack. I had already seen all of that. But as I looked at it with fresh eyes, I suddenly saw the people in this story did nothing wrong to end up over leveraged. If you think about it, all they did was sit there, be present, and listen to the teaching. That's it. That is all that they did to be responsible for ending up in this impossible situation of over leverage. And it became so clear to me as I was studying that this was a very specific message for so many of you who have been judging yourselves for the situation you're in. Now, I won't make you share your business with the world. This isn't AA. This isn't a men's small group where everybody has to confess stuff. But if you're brave enough to admit I would love to hear from some of you in the comments here who are willing to say, Stefan, you're talking to me. I have been judging myself for the situation I'm in. Let me know in the comments if that is you. I have been judging myself for the situation I'm in. And the reason this matters so much is the more we judge something in our lives, the less power we have to change that. Please write that down if you're taking notes or type that out in the comments. The more that we judge something in our lives, the less power we have to change it. It keeps us stuck. And the uniquely challenging thing about being overleveraged and feeling overleveraged is that so many times when we end up in that experience, and I know because I've been there, We judge ourselves for ending up in that position. And people ask themselves, what should I have done differently? And if only I had done this or that or could go back and not hire this person and do that instead. And it's my own fault because so many times we judge ourselves for ending up in that position. And I want to speak to this very directly because some of you listening today, you made decisions in the past that you now regret. Some of you made investments that turned out to be disappointments. Some of you took on debt that built up over time and it now feels impossible and overwhelming and like a big mistake. Some of you keep replaying something in your past over and over and over mentally. Some of you are endlessly questioning yourselves and your decisions, always wondering if you're doing it wrong. And I felt called to point this out so loud and clear to you today. The people in this story did nothing wrong to end up over leveraged. On the contrary, in fact, the truth is the people in this story were just on a spiritual journey doing their best to learn and spend time with God. And yet they end up over leveraged. And I think this is so important for us to recognize because if we can look at the people in this story and say, you know what? They don't need to be judged. They're not worthy of judgment. They they don't deserve any judgment for ending up in this position. And they were doing their best and they did nothing wrong. And they were just on a spiritual journey trying to learn and spend time with God. If we can look at the people in this story and say, I'm not going to judge them. They just ended up over leveraged. It is what it is then maybe we can look at ourselves with that same grace and compassion and neutrality and say, maybe I don't have to judge myself for ending up over leveraged. 
Maybe I did nothing wrong to end up here. And maybe even if I did, there is a grace and God sees me in innocence and God is not invested in punishing me anyway. So maybe it's time to let the judgments go. Maybe it's time to release the past. Maybe it's time to forgive myself. Maybe it's time to accept the moment I'm in without judgment. Maybe it's time to embrace the moment I'm in without limitation. I want to invite you today to recognize this principle number one, that God is not judging you for any situation you may be in. And I want to challenge you today. Can you release all judgments on whatever position that you're in? Because even if you feel completely over leveraged today, you are completely and unconditionally loved. And that is a deeper truth than anything else. Even if you feel completely over leveraged and overwhelmed today, you are completely and unconditionally loved. And I want to offer to you in this moment, what if over leveraged is just the starting point of a miracle? What if over leveraged is just the starting point of a miracle. That brings us to principle number two on the path to overflowing. Principle number two, which tells us God is not intimidated by your situation. This is connected, of course, to principle number one, but it takes it a step further because principle number one tells us God is not judging you for any situation that you may be in. So it is certainly time to release the judgment on yourself that is blocking you from the possibilities and the change anyway. But then principle number two tells us not only is God not judging, God is not intimidated by your situation. And I really felt called to pause here and say, there is nobody listening to this that is too far gone. There is nobody listening to this that this does not apply to. There is nobody listening to this that cannot shift into overflow this year. If you dare to believe it, if you dare to believe that that is true for you as well, this is available to all. There's not a single person listening today that can't shift into overflow this year. And I wanted to give this example. Many of you may be familiar with an author by the name of Rhonda Byrne who wrote what became a best-selling book globally and ultimately a documentary, et cetera, et cetera, known as The Secret. But what a lot of people don't know about that book and about her journey and about her story is that right before The Secret came out, Rhonda Byrne was over $2 million in personal debt. And yes, you heard me right. (laughs) Over $2 million in debt right before The Secret came out. Now, I don't know what your over-leveraged reality or circumstance or situation looks like. I don't presume that yours is a $2 million or more situation, but I don't presume it's not. There are people listening to this in all sorts of positions, in all sorts of circumstances right now. But I felt led to share that example just to say nobody is too far gone. Nobody is too over their head. Nobody is too over leveraged to move into overflow. And even Rhonda Byrne, who found herself in debt over $2 million, was just one idea away, one project away, one success away from her entire life changing and her finding herself in a new reality that had more overflow than she had ever fathomed. And I'm not sharing that story to encourage grandiosity here. I'm not suggesting that the goal for us should be to rack up $2 million of debt so we can have the most dramatic, epic, unbelievable story of overflow possible. I'm not suggesting or implying that. But I do find that story incredibly inspiring about this truth, 
that none of us are ever too far gone. And overflow is always closer than we think. And principle number two today is that God is not intimidated by any situation. You say, Stefan, how do you know that? You don't know me. You don't know all the details of my situation. How can you say that it's not a problem, that it's not too much or too far gone? Here's why I know that God is not intimidated by your situation today. Number one, because there is an infinite supply. God does not have any lack. God does not have any shortage. God does not have any scarcity. There is an infinite and invisible source and supply that never runs out and is always replenishing. So number one, there is an infinite supply. Number two, God is not intimidated by your situation because there are so many ways to get abundance to you that you can't see and you don't have to produce on your own. There are so many ways to get abundance to you that you can't see and you don't have to produce on your own. God is not limited to just a job or an employer, or a paycheck. God is not limited to what you've experienced in the past. God is not limited to what you can see, or what you know to pray for, or what you know to even think about expecting right now. There are ways to get abundance to you that you can't see, and even better, that you don't have to produce on your own. That's how I know God is not intimidated by your situation. And then number three, because on the level of principle, what we know is that God can do in a moment what otherwise would take extensive work and effort and delay in the realm of time and space. That was a meaty sentence, so let me read it again. God can do in a moment what otherwise would take extensive work and effort and delay on the level of time and space. See, this is what I love about this story. If we were to look at this from a human perspective, from a visible perspective, from a 3D world, time and space, linear perspective, it should have taken eight months. It should have taken a thousand hours. It should have been utterly impossible to feed 15 to 20,000 people with what they had available to them, which by the way, this is a really cheesy preacher joke, but the joke at least in churches in the South is that what Jesus fed the crowd with was a Long John Silver's lunch combo. I don't know how that's going to land with people in this teaching. Let me know if you are familiar with or have eaten at the American fast food restaurant Long John Silver's I know that these teachings reach over 120 countries all around the world, many different cultures, many different languages. So for a lot of you, Long John Silver's is not something you are familiar with, not a reference you may understand. But for those of you who have experienced that American seafood fast food restaurant, let me know in the comments. But that's what the old preachers would say in the South, right? It was a long John Silver's lunch combo here of a little bit of fish and a little bit of bread. And the point is, a little bit of fish and a little bit of bread should not in any way, shape, or form have been able to feed this crowd. It should have been impossible. It should have taken eight months. It should have taken a thousand hours. And yet this is the truth that God can do in a moment what otherwise would take extensive work and effort and delay in the realm of time and space. And I pray that you hear this today because my goal is to open you up to miracles. My goal is to open you up to possibilities. My goal is to open you up to the fact that there are infinite ways for good to unfold, for good to find you, for good to enter your life in ways that you can't predict and in ways that you would never expect. Beyond the work, the effort, the delay that you think it's going to have to take in the realm of time and space. But we've got to get this. Principle number two on the path to overflow today. God is not intimidated by your situation. 
It is no problem for God. It's not too big. It's not too much. It's not too over leveraged. God is not intimidated. And then principle number three. Principle number three on the path to overflow tells us God is only ever asking you for what you have. Not to take it, but to multiply it into more. God is only ever asking for what you have. Not to take it, but to multiply it into more. And I really want to hone in on this in a couple of ways, from a couple of angles today. First of all, I want to talk about here. God never asks for something you don't have in a way that leaves you stuck and helpless and powerless. Remember that. God is not the author of confusion, and God is never invested in you being stuck. So God is never going to leave you stranded, powerless, helpless. God never asks for something you don't have. And I just want to hone in on this for a moment more because I feel called to speak to this just for the theology nerds out there. I can hear somebody saying, well, Stefan, I was taught sometimes God asks us for things we don't have to stretch our faith. Sometimes God asks us for things we don't have so that God can do the impossible, right? I hear somebody saying that in consciousness right now, and I want to address that because this is actually a very important point. Even that is still God asking you for something that you have. Because in a moment of believing for the impossible, you know what God is asking you to work with? Your faith. Your belief. This is why it is said that all things are possible for the one who believes. And you are the one because even if you feel like you have nothing else in this moment, you have faith. You have belief. You have the power to believe. So even if God is asking you to believe for something big, even if you feel like, Steph and I am believing for the impossible, I still take a stand on this truth today. God is always asking you, not for what you don't have, but to work something you have, even if that's just your gratitude or your celebration or the choice to work your faith. And what I know to be true is that God is never asking you for something you don't have in a way that would leave you stuck or helpless or powerless, but rather God will often ask, what is in your hands? What do you have available? What can you give right now? What can you create right now? What can you sow right now? What can you share right now? What can you contribute right now? And there are so many Sunday school stories I could go through where God asks people, what is in your hand? I remember one time I heard a talk around this idea that the miracle is in the room. And it was so powerful because the idea of this talk was that people often think the miracle is somewhere else. It's in somebody else, something else, somewhere else, outside of the room, outside of their circumstances, outside of their life. And this talk stuck with me because it was all around the idea that the miracle is in the room. The miracle is in what you have. The miracle is in what you have left. I think about Marianne Williamson using the example of Cinderella in the famous fairy tale who was ready to go to the ball. And she already had everything she needed in the room to go to the ball. It just had to transform. It just had to be transformed. But the pumpkin was perfect. The mice were perfect. The rags she had were perfect. Everything she had was perfect to take her to the ball. It just had to be transformed. And I just believe it is a truth that the miracle is always in the room. The miracle is always in your house. The miracle is always in what you have left. And you have what you need 
to go to the ball. It might just have to be transformed. I'm trying to tell somebody today. You have everything you need inside of you to walk across this bridge from over leverage to overflowing. It might just have to be transformed. And as I said, there are so many ancient stories that many of us learned in Sunday school where God asks somebody, what do you have? And sometimes it is a jar of oil. And sometimes it is the ability to go dunk in a river. And sometimes it is a staff that they can hold in their hand. And sometimes it is a family member that they've been overlooking. And sometimes it is a little tiny thing that nobody would think had any power or potential within it. But there are so many stories where God asks, what do you have? Because the miracle is going to be in something you have. And then here's the key. Here's the second layer that I wanted to speak to this principle number three from. When God asks you for something you currently have, what you've got to know is this. God is never, ever trying to take something from you. But rather, God is always trying to get more to you. God is never, ever trying to take something from you, but rather, God is always trying to get more to you. And on this note, I felt led just to tell somebody today, please know that your destiny is inherently possible for you. And that is still the case. And that has never stopped being the case. You haven't missed it. You haven't messed it up. Today is the day to start believing again. This is the moment to bring your vision back to life. And let me know in the comments if this is for you. Let me know in the comments if you are affirming this with me today. Today is the day that I start believing again. This is my moment to bring my vision back to life. This is that moment. This is the moment where I bring my vision back to life. That brings me to principle number four on the path to overflow. Principle number four, which tells us God is asking you. In fact, I would actually revise this in real time and say God is inviting you to sit down and rest. God is inviting you to sit down and rest. This is such an important detail in the story of this miracle that I don't want us to miss. Before there could be provision, before there could be multiplication, before the miracle could occur, there was an instruction given. And the instruction was, have the people sit down. Have everyone be seated. And God, I pray that I can articulate this the way that you've shown it to me, the way that I see it and feel it. But I really believe there is a powerful principle here in this instruction. Have the people sit down. And I just hear God saying to somebody today, I know how over leveraged you are. I know the position you're in. I know how impossible or dark or painful it feels right now. I see you there. I would never leave you. I have not abandoned you. You are not alone. I see you. I am with you. I know how over leveraged you are. I know the position you're in, but know this. Know that you are safe and I am with you and you are held. And in this moment, I am inviting you. Rest now. Trust now. Surrender now. Because God is saying to you today, it's going to be okay. The end of the story is overflow. It's going to be okay. 
the end of the story is overflow. And there is an inherent trust required in the instruction to sit down and rest, the invitation to sit down and rest. Because do you hear that that is the opposite of what people would want to do in a crisis situation, in an emergency situation, in a situation that did not look good and seemed to be urgent and seemed to be only getting worse? I'll be honest, if I was in that crowd, I would be trying to leave 10 minutes before Jesus was finished speaking just to make sure that I didn't get caught in a line, you know, 90 minutes long trying to get a lift on the way out. I would be tempted to leave. I would be tempted to slither through that crowd like the skinny person I am, trying to see if I could get out as fast as I could. Because truthfully, I would probably be starving. I would be thirsty. I would need a bathroom and I would need three beverages. And I, I mean, I'm just being real here. I would be wanting to get out of there if I was in that crowd realizing they had no food. I might be tired at that point. I might be dehydrated at that point. I might be hangry at that point. Who knows? But can we understand? People would have had the instinct to run. People would have had the instinct to get restless. People would have had the instinct to flee the scene. And you better make sure that you feed your family. You better make sure that you take care of yourself before the situation turns bad. And yet Jesus gives a counterintuitive instruction and invitation and invites everyone to sit down and rest. And the way that I see it is the only way that you would do that is if you somehow could trust that you were going to be okay. If you somehow trusted that you were too loved to not be taken care of. If you somehow trusted that you were not gonna be stranded, that you were not gonna be left abandoned and alone. If you somehow trusted that you were going to be okay in the end. And so before we move on to principle number five, I just wanna linger here for another moment because I really believe this instruction and invitation is coming to you in your car, in your house, on the plane, in that hotel room, into your earbuds, through your television, through your phone, however and wherever you are connected to this teaching right now. I believe this invitation is coming to you. Sit down and rest. You are safe. I am with you. You are held. It is safe to rest now. It is safe to trust now. It is safe to surrender now. It is really going to be okay. And the end of the story is overflow. And that brings me to principle number five on the path to overflow. Principle number five. God invites us to put something we have into the hands of God, trusting the best possible outcome. God invites us to put something we have into the hands of God, trusting the best possible outcome. You know, I love the way that this story involves something so simple and basic and mundane as one little kid's pre-prepared lunch. That's all we're talking about here. That's all that they had. That's all that was present at the beginning of this story of a miracle. But isn't that a principle? about miracles overall that we know to be true, it often starts small. In fact, as I'm teaching this today, I'm thinking about all the various stories of the miracles of Jesus, and it never really looked good at the beginning of the story. Like in one story, it just looked like wine that had run out and all they had left was water. In another story, 
It just looked like a pile of mud on the ground that nobody would have ever thought would lead to a healing. In several stories, it looked like a funeral. It looked like somebody was no longer with us. It looked like the story was over and there was no hope and it was too late. And yet the story ended with new life. The story ended with a resurrection. And again, I just reiterate this truth today. How it looks at the start doesn't matter because it doesn't determine how it finishes. And the end of the story is always good. And the end of the story is always overflow. And I just came to encourage somebody today. It doesn't matter what it looks like right now. It doesn't even matter how long it's been this way. And I don't say that with a lack of compassion. I don't say that to say your pain doesn't matter. Your story doesn't matter. Your experience doesn't matter. It's just that it's not a limitation or a predictor of what happens next. And I came to tell you today, the end of the story is good. The end of the story is overflow. But it often starts small. And often, God delivers the miracle to us. Delivers the breakthrough. Delivers the blessing in the form of a seed. I am so struck by this with this story. Because what started as one little boy's lunch from home turned into a feast for an arena with full baskets to the point of overflowing surplus leftover. Feel the magnificence of that. Feel the power of that. This is the possibility of a miracle from over leverage to overflowing that it can start out with one little boy's pre-packaged lunch from home and it can turn into a feast for an arena with full baskets to the point of overflowing surplus leftover. And there's a paradox in this truth, right? Because on one hand, There is something for me to do. There is something that I can do. God is not asking for something I don't have. God is not leaving me here stuck, powerless, helpless. I'm not stranded. I'm not trapped. There is a move that I can make and something I can choose, something I can do. And it's a tiny step, a baby step, a next step. But when I take that step, when I do what is within my power to do, then God does more than my greatest request, my most unbelievable dream, and my wildest imagination. This is the paradox. There is something I can do. And it may not feel like much. It may feel like a tiny step, a baby step, a next step that's hardly even worth talking about, much less celebrating. But when I do what only I can do, God does what only God can do. And God can do more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and your wildest imagination. You know, there are many moments in life where we find ourselves temporarily not feeling like we have all that we need for all that we're called to do. Any person, any leader, anybody out there who would tell you otherwise is lying. We have all had a moment where it felt like God, I don't have what it takes right now. I feel like I'm missing something. I feel like I don't have all that is required in whatever way for all that I'm called to be. Everybody has been there. We've all had those moments. And yet this is a truth that I've learned. If you ever find yourself in a position where what you have does not seem to be enough to meet your need. You've got to know this. What you have in that moment must 
than be a seed. If what you have does not seem to be enough to possibly meet your need, the only answer is that what you have must be a seed. And the good news is seed is all that it takes to create a harvest. Therefore, what you have is always what you need for a miracle. You know, especially in the years of growing my business, there have been so many moments where money would flow in and it wasn't a huge number. It wasn't a lot. It didn't feel like even maybe enough for my needs, for the budget, for my expenses, but there would be so many moments where money would flow in and I had a commitment to give every time I received. I had a commitment to give as the first thing that I did after receiving and a commitment to give at a certain specific set level no matter what. And there is power, by the way, in a commitment. There is power in a commitment that lives on the inside of you and is more powerful than any circumstance because that kind of commitment will very quickly change your circumstances before you know it. And so there would be these moments where money would flow in. And I knew I had decided to give. I was committed to give. And so it wasn't even a question. I just knew I was going to give. But I would find myself doing so, thinking, God, I'm choosing to give. I'm choosing to believe in overflow. I'm choosing to believe that there is more than enough. But if I'm being honest as I give, I'm still waiting on more. If I'm being honest, what I just received is still not enough for all that I require in this moment. And that's such a sensitive vulnerable at times scary moment to be in where you still haven't yet seen all that you need show up and it still feels a little fragile and scary and vulnerable because what you have currently is not yet enough to meet your need but I have found this to be a truth every single time over and over again and again. And part of what helped me give with confidence and courage and commitment in those moments is coming back to this truth that when what I have doesn't appear to be enough to meet my needs, that must mean what I have in my hand right now is a seed. And this is not its final form. This is not where the story ends. This is not the outcome. But what I have in my hand is a seed. And a seed is more than enough to produce a bountiful harvest. And my job is to honor and to plant and to sow the seed that I have in my hand. And I want you to write down this truth if you're taking notes. Somebody please type this out in the comments. What you have is always what you need for a miracle. What you have is always what you need for a miracle. Business owner, I'm talking to you. What you have is what you need. Coaches, I'm talking to you. Leaders, I'm talking to you. What you have is what you need. Parents, I'm talking to you. What you have is what you need. People who require a breakthrough in their relationship their marriage or their family. I'm talking to you. What you have is what you need. People with a big vision, a big dream, a big destiny. This word is particularly relevant for you. What you have is always what you need for a miracle. And as I said earlier, the miracle is within you. The miracle is in your hand. The miracle is in something you have. The miracle is in the room. The miracle is in what you have left. Don't think you've missed your moment and don't miss your moment right here and now. The miracle is in what you have. What you have is always what you need for a miracle. Nothing more, nothing less. You do your part. 
You do what only you can do, and God will do what only God can do. But I invite you to affirm with me today. Everybody write this out. Everybody type this out in the comments. Everybody speak this out loud if you feel led to. I have the perfect ingredients for a miracle in my situation right now. I feel this so strongly. I have the perfect ingredients for a miracle in my situation right now. I can feel across all space and time people claiming this, knowing this, receiving this by faith right now all around the world. We do this together as a family. We affirm together now. I have the perfect ingredients for a miracle in my situation right now. And as you affirm that, please note, you don't have to know how to make it happen. You just have to surrender and trust the one who always creates overflow. You don't have to know how to make it happen. That's the great news today. You just have to surrender and trust the one who always creates overflow. But make no mistake about it. The flow of the miracle in this story is the flow of overflow. And I know I just used the word flow way too many times in a row, but I want to read you one more time from this text so that you can see the flow up close and personal for yourself. The text says, Then Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, gazed into heaven, and gave thanks to God. Notice here a gratitude, an acknowledgement, a celebration, an appreciation of, a giving thanks for that which is present, for that which is already here, for that which is in your hand right now. What if you paused in this moment and said, thank you God for every good and perfect gift that has flowed into my life up to this point. Thank you God for waking me up today. Thank you God for bringing me here here to this moment. Thank you, God, for what I do have in my hand, even if it doesn't feel like much. Thank you, God, for the gift above all else of who I am and how much you love me. It says Jesus gave thanks to God and he broke the bread and the two fish and distributed them to his disciples to serve the people. And the food was multiplied right in front of their eyes. And those words give me chills because I am speaking this over my partners. I am speaking this over my community. I am speaking this over every person under the sound of my voice who is in agreement with this teaching today. I am believing and declaring over you that divine provision is not only going to appear, but is going to multiply in front of your eyes this year. But I want us to observe the flow of overflow here because it is so clear to me in this story. If you're taking notes, you can write this down, the flow of overflow. Something is given. God blesses it. Multiplication occurs. Let me read you the text one more time. Then Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish and gazed into heaven and gave thanks. And he broke the bread and the two fish and distributed them to his disciples to serve the people. And the food was multiplied right in front of their eyes. Do you see it today? The flow of overflow. Something is given. God blesses it. Multiplication occurs. Something is given. God blesses it. Multiplication occurs. Now there's three things that I want us to notice here. As we study the flow of overflow, where something is given, God blesses it, and multiplication occurs. Number one, I want us to notice overflow flows through daily bread. 
And I believe this is so significant for somebody today. There's a reason I believe this story emphasizes and also the reason I am emphasizing to you how simple and mundane and basic the ingredients for the miracle really were. Because I think a lot of times when we think overflow, we think about something grandiose. We think about something that's going to fall out of the sky. We think about something that has the energy of a lottery or a sweepstakes or a massive unexpected inheritance. But what if your miracle begins with what you perceive to be a tiny seed? Maybe even one so tiny you almost counted it out. What if the miracle begins with something you were overlooking or wouldn't even think twice about? What if your overflow doesn't begin with some massive waterfall out of nowhere? What if it begins right where you are? What if it begins with Long John Silvers? Number one, I want us to notice overflow flows through daily bread. Number two, Overflow blesses everybody connected to you. I want to emphasize this point to overcome the outdated and unhelpful religious notion that people who live in overflow are unspiritual, that people who live in overflow are greedy, that people who live in overflow must be inherently harming somebody else. And I think this story makes it clear overflow by definition blesses the world and blesses those around you blesses everybody connected to you i want us to notice that in this story today and then number three i want us to notice as we study the flow of overflow overflow is a gradual process of multiplication that just gets better and better and better you know, I shared with you that since I originally studied and taught and shared this particular theme, as I've been preparing and praying and studying over the past few weeks, God has given me new things for you all in this particular teaching. And this is one of them. I want to extra highlight. This is another new thing for you today because God is always doing a new thing. I pray that you are always participating in and open to and willing to receive the new thing God is doing. But the third thing that I, I really want us to notice that is brand new for me here is overflow is a gradual process of multiplication that just gets better and better. And this is significant to me because... I used to think of this story as representing instantaneous overflow. In fact, this is probably how I taught it if I went back and listened. Because this story does happen in an incredible way. And this story does involve an accelerated timeline. And as we've talked about, this story does involve a miracle that goes past what we would normally expect in the realm of space and time. And it didn't have to take eight months. And it didn't have to take a thousand hours of work. So in the past, I have often viewed this story only through the lens or primarily through the lens of instantaneous overflow. But as I was preparing and praying over today, God brought my attention to something specific that I had never seen before. Because the way it is written, the text describes Jesus begins to break the bread. And as he does, the bread begins to multiply. And so he hands some out and he begins to distribute and he hands some to the disciples and he says, here, take this bread, distribute it among the crowd. Here, you take this bread, distribute it among the crowd. Now you take this bread. And I don't know if I'm perfectly articulating this or not, but I want you to see the way that the text describes it. It is a process that's happening. It is a continual thing that's happening. It is an active, ongoing, in-the-moment thing that is happening. It's not like 
Suddenly, in a single moment, one lunch combo turned into an arena's full worth of food. And in a split second, Jesus snapped his fingers and boom, there it is. That's not the picture that this story is painting for us. That's not how it occurred. But rather, there was a steady blessing and breaking of the bread. And there was a steady generosity and a steady distribution. And as Jesus continued to give thanks, and as Jesus continued to bless, and as Jesus continued to break the bread, the bread continued to multiply, and it continued to multiply, and it continued to multiply. And in a very active, ongoing, process-oriented way, the bread multiplied and and multiplied and multiplied some more right in front of their eyes. And again, I don't know if I articulated that as well as I could. I pray that I said it in a way that made sense. And if I did it, God, I pray that you would make it make sense to every person listening right now. But before we moved forward with this teaching, I felt like I had to emphasize it's not so much about the instantaneous one and done, snap your fingers kind of overflow here, but rather this story represents the beginning of new provision. It represents a process of increase. It represents a continual multiplication of blessing that begins and never runs out until every single person has all their needs met, until every single person is full and satisfied and able to enjoy, until every single person ends up in overflow. That is what this story represents, and that is the flow of overflow. Something is given. God blesses it. Multiplication occurs. Something is given. God blesses it. Multiplication occurs. Now in a few moments, we're going to pray together and I want to pray for every single person who is under the sound of my voice. Because as I stated before and I'll state it again now, I really do believe this is your year to make the shift either to shift into overflow for the first time ever as a new way of life or to shift into a greater dimension of overflow than you've ever experienced before. I really believe that and I'm going to pray that over you in just a moment. But before we do, I want to give every single person listening to this teaching, connected to this teaching right now, from all around the world, the opportunity to step into your own miracle today, right where you are. Now, you might be listening to this and thinking, Stefan, what are you trying to say here? (laughs) Are you telling people we can buy a miracle? No. You can't buy a miracle. They're not for sale. That's silly. That's not what this is about, and that's not what we're doing today. But while I don't believe in the idea that somebody could buy a miracle, I'll tell you what I do believe in. I do believe the truth is very clear, that your faith absolutely can move mountains. And that's what this is about. It is an opportunity to use your faith in a way you never have before. And I want to guide you through that in just a moment. Really the same way that I went through this process myself when I first got this revelation. And I'll say more about that in a second. But you know, as I was studying this, I was thinking about the little kid who was willing to sow the seed of his lunch. Think about this. He wasn't on stage. He wasn't part of Jesus' team. He wasn't a part of the teaching in any way. There wasn't fancy production or a perfectly produced environment to make this all exciting and glamorous. There were no flashy lights. There was no live DJ. There were no hot coals for him to walk on. 
by all accounts that we know. This is the wildest part to me. As far as we know, he didn't even speak to Jesus directly. If you've heard this story your whole life, I'm willing to bet you've never thought about this, but take a moment and think about this with me. Jesus never even spoke to him. And yet he was at the center of the miracle because there was a moment where somebody asked him, would you be willing to contribute something you have in this moment, even if it feels small, even if it feels insignificant, even if it feels like that won't do much, would you be willing to contribute something you have in this moment? Because a miracle is right now in the works and your contribution however it may look in this moment is perfect your contribution is so much more powerful than you think and a miracle is in the works and not only are you not going to lose out by giving because it's all going to return to you and return to you with more, return to you multiplied. But beyond that, what you give is going to bless this community and bless other people's lives in ways that you could never imagine. I just couldn't get away from this as I was preparing this teaching. That as far as we know, he never even spoke to Jesus. Someone just asked him to give, and we don't know exactly why. We don't know what moved him in that moment. We don't know whether he did it with complete confidence and certainty or whether he did it scared, but he did it scared anyway. We just know he had the faith and the vision and the trust to say yes. And because he did, a miracle occurred. And and by the way, a miracle that we're still talking about thousands of years later. This is why you should never overlook the power of a seemingly small seed. Because we're talking about lunch. We're talking about a few bucks. We're talking about Long John Silver's but a miracle occurred that we're still talking about thousands of years later. A miracle that was important enough, by the way, that even the authors who said, I'm not gonna put in the Christmas story. I can leave this part out. I'm not gonna include the resurrection. Every single author decided that this story was essential. Every single author decided you and I needed to have this story for centuries to come. That miracle happened because he had the faith and the vision and the trust to say yes with a seemingly small seed. What a story. I can't get away from this. What a story this is from over leveraged to overflowing. Now, I know this might sound funny, but this is the way that I really feel it. And I wanted to share this with you today. If I could send to every single person listening to this teaching right now an overflow button and all you had to do was push that button and it would take you immediately into instantaneous overflow in every area of your life. Believe me, I would love that. And I would send that button to you right here and right now. If I could offer you a button and all you had to do was press that button today and in an instant you would have 100 tons of overflow in every currency immediately drop into every single one of your accounts again believe me i would offer you the button or if i could press it on your behalf i would press it for you right here and right now as i press record but of course the truth is That's not how I know this to unfold. That's not the flow of overflow. That's not how it works in the invisible realm. What I know to be true is that it flows through moments. 
It flows through a lunch. It flows through a seed. It flows through generosity. It flows through the blessing and the breaking of bread. It flows through a Long John Silver's lunch combo. And the flow of overflow is something is given. God blesses. Multiplication occurs. Something is given. God blesses. Multiplication occurs. Something is given. God blesses. Multiplication occurs. For anybody feeling called to give in this moment, we're going to put a link on the screen. It's also going to be in this episode description, lovegrovepartners.com. There is no obligation, there is no pressure, there is no manipulation on any of this today. Simply an opportunity and simply an invitation to give if you feel called to give. The link will be on the screen, the link will be in the episode description, lovegrovepartners.com. But I feel called today to share with you, you know, when this revelation first hit me, I knew immediately that I needed and wanted to sow a seed, giving it the assignment of overflow. Just as a farmer or a gardener has deliberate intention with what they plant, knowing what they're intending to grow, knowing the harvest that they intend to see in the end, We believe in this community, in sowing with intention, in knowing what we are setting into motion and giving our seed an assignment. For as it is written in ancient scriptures, that which you sow, you will always certainly reap. According to that which you have sown, that you will reap and as long as the earth remains you can count on it the law guarantees there will always be seed time and harvest and so when this revelation first hit me i knew that i needed and wanted to sow a seed and i gave it the assignment of overflow i said god there's a clear truth here that I am ready to step into today. That overflow is your will for me. Which means overflow must be available to me. And it might feel far away. And I might not be experiencing it right now. And I might not feel like I even know how to get there right now. But I'm willing to step into this truth and decide that it applies to me today to decide today that it's not in fact too good to be true. I'm willing to believe it. I'm willing to receive it. I'm willing to step into it today for myself. And God, I don't know how to get myself to overflow, but in this moment, I believe that you do. And I am trusting and releasing and surrendering. And I want you to know, When I sowed that seed that day, it felt like I was putting it all into the hands of God. Hear me on this, because I feel called to emphasize this. I I wasn't just putting my seed into the hands of God. I wasn't just putting a specific limited amount into the hands of God. That was a symbol, that was a stand-in, that was a representation for the fact that in that moment, I handed it all over. And I put all of my finances into the hand of God. And I said, God, I believe that when something ends up in your hands, there it is blessed. And there it becomes good. And there it multiplies. And I confess today, I don't know how to get myself to overflow. I don't know how to escape the patterns and the cycles of over leverage that I have been in for far too long. But I believe today that your will for me is overflow. I believe today that overflow must be available to me. And I choose to receive your plan to get me to overflow. I turn it all over to you. 
I put it all in your hands, and I know that the end of the story is overflow. And I am here to tell you today, the end of the story has been overflow. And in fact, the story continues and the story is still unfolding. And I am finding there are greater and greater and greater levels of overflow always to be discovered and to be lived into. But I think back on that seed, the seed that I sowed when I told God, I don't know how to get to overflow, but I believe that you do. Would you take me there? I trust you. I put it in your hands. This is my seed for overflow. And I just wanted to share this with you today because I believe there are people all over the world and this is a moment for you. This teaching has been for you. This message has been for you. And this opportunity is for you. And this is your moment to step into overflow. I believe when God speaks to you about something ever, on any topic, God speaks with a peace and an assurance and a confirmation. And it might be new and it might be scary and it might be a little bit out of your comfort zone, but there will be a peace within you that it is coming from a still, small voice that has your happiness in mind and your harvest in mind. So you can check in right now. God, is there something for me to give? Is there something for me to contribute? Is there something here for me today? You can take a second while the music plays to feel into that. You can pause this track to really sit with God and ask if you like. What would you have me to do today? What would you have me to give today? What would you have me to contribute today? But above all else, I really pray that there would be no one who listens to this teaching and counts yourself out because you think your seed is insignificant. I had someone just the other day tell me, Stefan, I thought about giving. I thought about partnering. I almost gave, but to be honest, I stopped myself because I felt like my seed would be embarrassingly small. I felt like my seed wouldn't do anything. I felt like my seed would be so insignificant and inconsequential. And I'm not gonna try to reteach the principles here, but I pray that I have convinced you in all of the truth of this teaching today, never diminish the power of a seed. Never underestimate what a seed can do. Never write off the ability that a seed has to turn into a bountiful harvest. And I'm here to tell you today, your seed is significant. And what you have in your hand is the perfect thing for a miracle. And the flow of overflow is that something is given, God blesses, multiplication occurs. Something is given, God blesses, and multiplication occurs. You know, somebody might be listening to this today, and you don't know me, you're new to me, you're unfamiliar with me. And so understandably, someone might cynically be thinking, this is just about money. You're just teaching this. You're just saying all of this because you want people's money. And by the way, I don't mind if you're here and you're cynical or you're unsure what to think. I don't mind if you're new to me. I don't mind if you have skepticism or doubt or cynicism about any of this. But just for a little context and just for you to know, as someone who has had a business for 10 years, who has sold many different products and services over the years, including in the past services for tens of thousands, even $100,000 to clients all over the world. Let me just assure you, this is not about money. 
If I wanted to do something with income or revenue or money as a priority, let me assure you, there are many, many, many ways I could go about that. And this is not that. I did not preach for hours and hours recording this for you because we needed money. And so I'll be very upfront with you. This is not life-changing money for me. That's not why I'm asking you to give or to contribute or to support this work. And you might say, well, Stefan, you're going to talk people out of giving. If this is not life-changing money, why give? But hear me on this. You're not giving because this is life-changing money for me. You're giving because this is life-changing work for somebody out there who a message of unconditional love and faith and power is going to reach and it's going to impact their life and it's going to change them forever. You're giving because this work is life-changing for somebody out there and maybe more importantly, You're giving today in this moment because it will be a life-changing harvest for you. That's why this matters. We don't need the money. We don't need anything from you or anyone who is listening today. That's not what this is about. But this work is life-changing. And when you sow a seed with an intention and an expectation and an assignment, you reap a life-changing harvest in your own life. That's what this is about today. Something is given. God blesses. Multiplication occurs. Right before we pray, I want to share one more thought. There is a quote that says, Faith begins where the will of God is known. Faith begins where the will of God is known. The essence of this quote is very simply this. If you don't know what's available to you in the spiritual realm, in the invisible realm, you can't ever claim it. You won't ever choose to or even have the opportunity to receive it by faith if you don't know it's there if you don't know it's possible, if you don't know it's available to you. And so the quote says, faith begins where the will of God is known. My goal today, my intention today, above all else, has been to impart to you this truth that God's will for you is to live in overflow. And within that truth, there is the knowing that there must be a way and a path for you to get there. Within that truth, there is the knowing that God knows how to get you to overflow. But that really has been my heart and my goal today is that you would walk away from this teaching and faith would have begun because the will of God is now known that you were created to live in overflow. And so I want to invite every single person who is giving today, whatever number you are led to give, whatever you feel called to do at lovegrovepartners.com. All the options are available to you there. I just want to offer to you, in the section where you can type something out where you give, or on your end, maybe as something you want to write out physically or something that you want to type out on a device of your own, I want to invite you to sow with this intention today. God, I put it all into your hands. Take me into overflow this year. God, I put it all into your hands. Take me into overflow this year. This is a moment of trust. This is a moment of surrender. This is a moment of generosity. This is a moment of faith. This is a moment of release. And I believe there are people all over the world who will be sowing with this intention today. God, I put it all into your hands. Take me into overflow this year. Type that out. Write that out. Put it in the comments. Put it in your notes. Claim it for yourself as you sow today. 
And I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. But my prayer and my belief is that as you do what only you can do and what you feel called to do in this moment, God is about to do what only God can do. And God knows how to get you to overflow. And I'm about to pray for you and pray for specifically that. But I celebrate that right now, all over the world, something is being given and it is instantly and immediately blessed and multiplication is about to occur. Something is being given, it is being blessed and multiplication is occurring. Something is being given. God is blessing it right now even as I speak these words and multiplication is even right now beginning to occur. If you need to pause this video, pause this track, pause this episode, take care of your giving, get your seed into this good ground, in this atmosphere of faith, and then come back here and join me as we move into a prayer space together. If it's safe and comfortable to do so where you are, you can close your eyes if you'd like as we pray together now. Thank you, God, for every person who is joining me for this teaching and joining me in prayer right now. Thank you for who they are. Thank you for their life. Thank you for their journey. Thank you for their story. Thank you for bringing them to this moment. Thank you for guiding them to this exact teaching and this exact moment. God, we pause right now to declare the truth that in you, we live and move and have our being. You are the source of it all. You are the source of all provision. You are the source of every good and perfect thing, every single gift in our lives. And we take a moment to just rest in your presence. We take a moment to just let ourselves be loved. God, I speak the truth from this teaching that so many times the divine instruction and invitation being given to us is sit down and rest. It is safe to be seated. It is safe to rest. It is safe to relax. It is safe to surrender. It is safe to let go. And I pray that over every person who is connected to this prayer right now. I know some of them have been terrified. I know some of them have been anxious. I know some of them have been unable to sleep at night, unable to shake the racing, anxious thoughts, unable to find their way back to peace. And right now, God, I speak rest over them and into their lives. May they be able to be still in this moment and know that you are God and that they are safe and they are held and everything is going to be okay. God, we let ourselves rest in this moment knowing it is safe to rest, it is safe to release, it is safe to let go. And we let ourselves be loved. We let you love us. God, I have shared before with my community this principle I have learned of the difference between a supply and a demand consciousness. And one thing I know for sure is that in a consciousness of demand, always placing a demand on ourselves, always trying to be better, always trying to do more, always pushing and straining and striving, doing everything in our power to make it happen. God, when we live in a demand consciousness long enough, we will end up exhausted and burnt out and most of all over leveraged but today God every person under the sound of my voice is free to leave that demand consciousness and to move into a supply consciousness where we know that you are and you have an infinite source and supply that never runs out and never runs dry 
God, you are always loving us. You are always giving to us. You are always blessing us. May we receive that truth today. May it wash over us now. You are always loving us. You are always blessing us. You are always giving to us. And so we move into a supply consciousness now. We rest in your love and we let ourselves be loved. God, I speak this truth for every person hearing this prayer that all of God is right where they are. They are not alone. You are with them. Your infinite, unconditional love and presence and embrace is in the room with them closer than their very breath right now. I pray that right now they would know that. I pray that right now they would feel that. And God, because you are in the room, because you are with them, because all of you is right where they are, the miracle is also right where they are. And I speak over them this truth that they have everything they need for the miracle. They have not missed it. They have not messed it up. Nothing is too far gone. They are exactly where they are supposed to be, and they are in the perfect position for a miracle. I speak that truth for every person right now. Thank you, God, for all that you have shown us during our time today together. Thank you, God that your will for us is overflow. We step into that today. We say yes to overflow. Yes to surplus, excess, more than enough. Yes to above and beyond. Yes to more than can even be contained. God, would you teach us on the deepest level of our consciousness that that is how it was meant to be, that that is what we were created for, that that is your will for us. God, that you endlessly create overflow, that we are able to live in overflow, that it does have our name on it, that it is meant for us, and that we are able to get to overflow even if it has felt far away in the past. But this is a new moment, and you are doing a new thing right now, and we are open and ready and willing to have a new experience right now. Thank you, God, for giving us a new standard today. Thank you, God for giving us a new definition of overflow that we step into today because overflow according to you is all needs met and enough for us to be full and satisfied and enjoy enough to bless the people around us and be generous and most importantly god overflow means that after all is said and done there is still more there is still abundance there is still some left over thank you for enlarging our vision and expanding our consciousness today around what overflow really means Thank you, God, that you have a plan to move us from over leverage to overflowing. And you know, no matter who we are or where we are or what situation we find ourselves in today, that you know how to get us to overflow. Thank you, God, for this principle that you are not judging any of us for the situation we find ourselves in. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that you are not judging us. And I pray today that every single person listening to this teaching would release any judgments they have been carrying on themselves, on their situation, on any part of their lives or their circumstances. God, we release the judgments. We receive forgiveness, we forgive ourselves. We receive forgiveness, we forgive ourselves. We receive forgiveness and we forgive ourselves. But you are not judging us and there is nothing that we are going to judge moving forward from this moment. Thank you, God, that not only are you not judging any part of our situation, but you're not intimidated by our situation. We know there is an infinite supply. We know that you have infinite ways to get abundance to us, ways that we can't even see right now, ways that we don't even have to make happen on our own. 
we know, God, that you can do in a moment what otherwise would take extensive work and effort and delay in the realm of space and time. Thank you, God, that you don't need anything from us. And God, that you're never trying to take anything from us. But anytime you ask us for what we have, it is only and ever always because you want to multiply it into more, because you're trying to bless us, because you have our harvest in mind, because you're trying to give us something that is better than we can imagine. And so God, we are willing to hear this question, what is in your hand? What do you have available? What can you give right now? What can you create right now? What can you contribute right now? But God, we are sure of this truth, that you're never trying to take something from us, only ever to get something to us. Thank you, God, that our destiny is still real and possible and available, that we haven't missed it, that we haven't messed it up. But today, every single person in agreement with this prayer begins to believe again that this is the moment we bring the vision back to life. God, you know I love the truth in this story. That from something so small, from something so mundane, from something so basic, comes a miracle that we are still talking about thousands of years later. And I pray that every single person under the sound of my voice right now would know a miracle is so close to them. A miracle is not out of reach. A miracle is available to them right here and right now. God, I pray that all the truths I have taught today would be so practically helpful for people as they make the transition in their lives from over leverage to overflowing. God, particularly these distinctions that you showed me, First, that overflow flows in the form of daily bread. God, I pray that this idea would be supportive to people as they make this transition. Because I know there's many people out there, and God, they would just prefer one giant delivery. One unbelievable inheritance or lottery or sweepstakes. One massive check showing up on their doorstep. And God, I'm not saying that you can't provide in infinite ways. And I'm not saying that all of that is not going to happen for somebody out there. But God, what I also know to be true from my own experience and what I also know from this story is that sometimes it flows one meal at a time, one day at a time, one moment at a time. Sometimes it flows through the basic and the mundane. Sometimes it flows in gradual, consistent, ever increasing, ever multiplying, ever expanding ways. I pray that we would be open to receive the continuous, ever expanding, ever increasing, ever multiplying overflow that begins today in our lives. Thank you for the truth, God, that overflow blesses everybody connected to us, that it's not selfish, it's not unspiritual, it's not greedy to want to live in the overflow that is available to us in the invisible realm. But in fact, the world benefits. The world is blessed. The world is better off when we do. Thank you, God, that overflow is a gradual process of multiplication that just gets better and better and better. And we let that begin today. We open up to that today. We let ourselves receive that today. God, as I said very frankly a few moments ago, if there was a button I could hand out or a button I could press, you know I would distribute it and you know I would press it so that every single beloved person in my community could just be instantly moved into overflow. But God, as I shared with them as honestly and transparently as I know how, 
there's a flow to this. There's a method to this. And that's not often how it works. And thank you, God, for showing us this flow that something is given and you bless it and multiplication occurs. So God, I pray for every single person who is receiving this truth today. I pray for every single person who is sowing right now in trust and faith and surrender. I pray for every single person who is daring to believe that this is possible for them and available to them. I pray for every person who is saying yes to their own miracle. I pray for every person who right now, God, is deciding as you led me to decide in the past. I am moving into the promised land of overflow. And it doesn't have to happen overnight. But God, I trust you. I know this is what is meant for me. And I choose to believe with certainty this is where my story is going to end. God, I pray that for everybody who is sowing in this moment, their seed would return to them so quickly in a way that would show them you have so much more in store for them than they ever imagined and you're never trying to take something from them you always just have more in store for them I pray that they would see a massive bountiful incredible harvest both in ways they expected and ways they never even dreamed. Above all else, as we wrap this teaching up together today, and as we wrap our faith around the seed that is going into this good ground, I ask and I receive and I declare, this is the year that we as a community move into overflow and move into a level of overflow, a dimension of overflow, an experience of overflow that transcends everything we've seen up to this point. God, I don't know the plan for every single person. I don't know how to make it happen. I don't know for every person listening to this and joining me in agreement, joining me in faith today. I don't know what the most efficient way and powerful way and speedy way is for them to get to overflow, but you do. So I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would be with them. I pray that you would guide them. I pray that you would direct them. I pray that you would do in their life what only you can do. God, we choose to receive this truth. We choose to believe. We choose to activate our faith. We choose to sow. We choose to participate now. And as we do what we can do, we rest in the truth that you are right now and in the days to come doing what only you can do. And God, the stories you write, we see so clearly today, the stories you write and in overflow. We receive that over our story as well. In the most personal and individual of ways. Thank you, God, that for every single person now in agreement with this prayer, overflow is our destination. Overflow is where we're headed. And overflow is where we now get to live. And so it is, and so we are. Praying today in the name of Jesus at the center of this story we have read together. Amen, amen, and amen. Woo. Well, I got to tell you, I am feeling this one. And it has been a journey to get to this moment. I really do feel like for weeks and weeks now, I have been studying and praying and preparing and revising and editing and multiple recording sessions and re-records and places I felt led to try again, re-record it, say it a little bit differently. So I pray 
that this teaching has been so supportive and practical and helpful for you right where you are. As always, God, if there was anything that I left out, if there was anything I didn't communicate clearly, if there's anything else that people need that would supplement them in their journey right now, would you speak to them, God? Would you get it to them? But I'm going to leave it there. This is and this has been from over leverage to overflowing. I am so grateful for each and every one of you. And I am so excited for every single person who chose to sow something today in response to this powerful moment and to say yes to overflow. I really do believe this is going to be a landmark, classic teaching within this community that we look back on for years to come. And we will look back and celebrate what a monumental day this was in your life when you set something new into motion and put yourself on the path to overflow. So. If you haven't already and you're on YouTube, like this video and subscribe to the channel. If you are listening to this in a podcast form, make sure you are subscribed over on the podcast. All of those actions help us out a great deal. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being you. And thank you partners for supporting this work so that people just like you all around the world can receive a powerful message like this one of all that they were created for and all that they were intended to live in. I love you. I believe in you. I will see you back here very soon. And please know the best is yet to come.